The design of central bank digital currencies is a global effort of collaboration rather than competition. Will central banks have a say in the future of money? What are the benefits of digital currencies for central banks and the economy? Are CBDCs the future of finance? Over the course of this discussion, we'll look at the future of currencies and money from different aspects. Money and technology. Prospects for central bank digital currencies. Distinguished guests, thank you for staying with us at the Lan Folushi Lectures Conference. Our professional program continues with its first session, Money and Technology, Prospects for Central Bank Digital Currencies. The first discussion today, which will be a fireside chat, examined the recent CBDC research and application developments. Joining me on stage, please welcome Mr. Barnabas Virag, Deputy Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, who will moderate the discussion. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, we had three excellent speeches in the morning session, so now let's jump into the first panel. Uh, I think we heard in the morning session that nowadays the key, the number one enemy for the central banks is the inflation. That's true. So I can say in our case it's a whatever it takes moment. So we have to do our best to, to deliver the low inflation environment for, the, for our societies, for our economies. And uh, I have to say that I'm 100% I'm sure that we will be able to deliver the low inflation back uh, to our life. Um, so the number one issue is the inflation, but uh, in a pretty close uh, to the inflation, there is another issue that's the di digitalization, the di digitalization of the money. And, uh, and that will be the key topic of our panel we have now. Uh, we have two distinguished, well-experienced uh, guests, speakers in the panel, but let me introduce the topic uh, with three short slides. Uh, yeah, so why the digitalization of, of the money is one of the key topics nowadays for the central banks. So there are many, many motivations uh, behind the issue. Uh, the first is coming from a from a megatrend, so that's our life nowadays. The, the digital revolution is here. And of course, uh, the financial industry is one of those industry where, which is pretty near to the frontier. So the, the new technologies affect our daily life. The second one is the monetary transmission. So we are combating against the high inflation. Uh, we change the direction of the boat. Uh, but uh, it's also clear that we have a lot of liquidity in our financial systems, and it's pretty hard to, to, to manage a tightening cycle with, with a lot of liquidity within your financial system. So we have to improve the monetary transmission uh, looking ahead. The third motivation is the, is the crypto, crypto world. Uh, of course, we don't know that it's, 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 it's a transitory issue or, or more permanent. Uh, but of course, it's also a challenge for the central banks. And the final one is the financial inclusion. Uh, so now still uh, around one quarter of the total population who uh, do not have their own accounts globally. So of course, the financial inclusion is still an issue for the central banks. So we have several motivations. So let's look at uh, the snapshot we have nowadays. Uh, I would like to, to highlight the, the right-hand chart because in the last 
two or three years, we talked a lot about the COVID issues, about, the, about this terrible war we have in Ukraine, but there was also a big change in the life of the central bank. So in 2018 and 2019, only 15 or 20 central banks dealed with this uh, CBDC issue, with the digital currency issues. Nowadays, the number of these central banks has, uh, is near to one, 100. So, so there, there was a dramatic change in the number of, uh, of central banks who are dealing with the CBDC issue nowadays within uh, their daily practice. Uh, and of course, there are many central banks who are in a front runner status, so who are, who are uh, delivered pilot projects. And of course, there are many central banks who are in a, in a follower uh, status. And that's the last, that's the, that's the, that's, uh, the last uh, slide uh, from my side. So all of the big central banks uh, are thinking on the CBDCs very actively, both the Fed, both the ECB, and the PBOC. Uh, of course, within Hungary, we are a small uh, central bank, but uh, we try to remain close to the frontier. So that's why we are here. I would, I would like to stop here, and uh, I would like to open the panel, uh, waiting for our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Deputy Governor Virag for that introduction. Now, let me also introduce the participants of the chat. Mr. Morten Linemann-Beck, Centre Head of BIS Innovation Hub Switzerland and Mr. Mu Chang-Chun, the director of the Digital Currency Research Institute, the People's Bank of China, who will be joining us online. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Virag and our distinguished speakers. Thank you. So th thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Chang-Chun. Uh, I have to say that it's a, it's a fire, fireside chat, so with many quick questions, and uh, we are waiting for prompt answers. So I want to start with uh, Mr. Chang Chun. Uh, China started a research team on digital currencies already in 2014 and launched their Digital Currency Institute in 2016. This means that China was among the four pioneers of CBDC and started testing the asset in 2020. A year ago, EUN had more than 260 million individual wallets, while during the Winter Olympics, Mr. Chang Chun said that there are a couple million yuan worth of transactions every day. So based on this data, the EUN and the PBOC is one of the most advanced projects globally in terms of CBDCs. What motivated the PBOC to start research and progress so early? What were the most important driving factors behind it? So Mr. Chang Chun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Governor uh, Virag. And uh, nice to meet, uh, and I'm honored to attend this uh, Parasite uh, panel. And uh, firstly, I, I would like to say that uh, we feel obliged to start our CBDC uh, due to several uh, motivations. Uh, firstly, to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system. In recent years, we have witnessed a trend that a lot of uh, central banks are improving their payment systems by building, building up faster payment, and which will actually widen the access and include more, including more participants from different sectors and also extend the service hours and uh, uh, you know, improve the, uh, the capacity of the payment systems. So uh, the ECNY project uh, which we were we uh, we we actually call it uh, uh, DCP project uh, is one of our efforts 
to efforts to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system. Uh, the CBDC, uh, as you may know, that the fiat currency or fiat payment instruments issued by the central bank should also be digitalized uh, to meet the requirements of digital era. Um, the uh, ECNY pr provides actually 724 services to the general public and uh, actually uh, extended the service hour. And in addition, the ECNY system realized a higher efficiency with the feature of settlement upon payment. And also we strengthened our capacity. Uh, now we can support 10,000 TPS. So of course, in the future, we are going to uh, definitely will uh, um, add more capacity to, to the system. The last but not least, the ECNY join hands with uh, more participants from different sectors, including not only commercial banks uh, and FMIs, but also PSPs, fintech companies, telecom operators, and other uh, market players. So with those efforts, uh, we managed to increase the efficiency of the central bank payment system. Secondly, to provide, you know, the second motivation is to provide a backup or redundancy for the retail payment system. As you may know that in China, we have two big giants. And now uh, in, the, in the payment, retail payment sector, people get used to going out without any physical wallets, debit cards or credit cards, but just no mobile mobile phones inside. So uh, the Alipay and Tempe have already become uh, the significant important uh, financial infrastructure. So if anything bad happened to them, either financially or technically, that will bring very significant negative impact to our financial system or our financial market. So we have to be prepared and to provide a backup or redundancy for the retail payment system. Uh, through that, we digitalized the payment instrument issued by the central bank. The last but not least, to improve the motivations to improve the financial inclusion. The private sector actually provided financial services that cover most of the population. And while the remaining population in the remote and uh, poor areas may be underbanked, in addition, as mobile payments are so prevalent in China uh, for foreign uh, visitors and non-residents may also have difficulties in making payments in China uh, after the COVID, uh, all the foreign visitors may come back to China and they found out they cannot make any payments without uh, WeChat Pay, uh, TenPay or Alipay. And most of uh, the merchants in China don't accept cash, uh, credit cards or debit cards. So it will be ob obligation or, or responsibility for the central bank to cover these long tail users. Uh, Uh, so now I, I ask my colleague to, to do their own best to have a connection with Mr. Uh, Chang Chun. So now I would like to continue with Mr. Beck, and I would like to step back to that question uh, was raised by Mr. Patai. Uh, okay. Okay, Mr. Chang Chun. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear us, Mr. Chang Chun? Sorry. But last, actually, sorry, sorry, Modern. Uh, that will be uh, last word. Uh, uh, actually, we we uh, we charge no fee from the authorized arbitrators and individual users, so we can support uh, the foreigners. Uh, you know, open a digital wallet without opening a uh, you know traditional bank account in China. So. Uh, uh, moreover, 
we, we don't charge any fee from the users. So that will reduce the burden of the real economy and improve the business environment. So that's the, our, those are the motivations we have. Sorry, uh, Mr. Beck. Okay, thank Back you very you. much, uh, Mr. Chang Chun. So again, I would like to, yeah. Uh, so now I would like to, I would like to turn uh, to the next topic, uh, which was raised by Mr. Patai in the, in the, in the open, opening speech. Uh, so that's the interest bearing uh, uh, status of the CBDC. So there have been numerous articles warning against the dangers of this uh, feature, uh, foreshadowing of collapse of banking systems and financial intermediaries. However, an ever-widening literature argues that the picture is not nearly as dark as it seems at the first glance. The interest-bearing feature could bring many benefits without distorting banking systems. In addition, it could uh, significantly improve the transmission of monetary conditions, giving a new tool for central banks and renewing how central banks conduct monetary policy. So my question, what is your view and what's the BI's view on interest-bearing CBDCs? Can be the interest-bearing CBDC the future or not? Um, thank you, um, and thank you for, for having me. It's a, it's a great honor and, and pleasure definitely to be here. Um, turning to, to your question, um, I think you're, you're actually asking the wrong person because I'm a payments geek and I'm a monetary implementation nerd. So this, this idea that you could actually uh, have interest rate on all central bank uh, liabilities, I think is, is fascinating. Uh, 10 years, more than 10 years ago, I actually worked a summer at the Bank of England where we were trying to figure out what it would take for a central bank to pay continuous interest rates. And we figured out we couldn't do that with the current setup. The problem is today uh, in this world, we have a difference between intraday and overnight, but in an increasingly globalized world where there's 24, 7, 365, it seemed like a good idea potentially to have continuous interest rate. So I would say that if we are going to implement a new forms of central bank digital currencies, I would definitely try and design for that feature that you can pay interest rates. Are you gonna use that feature or not? I think it's a different uh, question. That's a question for policy. It might be that the right interest rate for retail CBDC or a, a general purpose CBDC is to keep it at zero. But I think it would be wise not to you know, eliminate that uh, choice just by, by design. Okay. Uh, so I'm turning back to Mr. Chang Chun. Uh, as mentioned before, the ECNY has an extremely wide user base. Uh, how can the ECNY become a profound platform for new innovative banking services involving the smart contracts? Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, as I said in the last uh, question, uh, that ECNY is a universal payment instrument uh, created by the uh, Central Bank of the People's Bank of China. So it, it supports uh, a variety of innovations and allow individual services and corporate services to be interoperated to realize synergy compared with traditional separated services. So actually I Personally, I, I, asked, I believe uh, the CBDC is a universal payment instrument. Uh, okay, so, the, so the, dig, the digital technology is not with us, it seems to me. Uh, so I want to I wanna touch the similar question uh, to Mr. Beck. Uh, about the smart smart contracts, so BIS delves into the into domestic uses of CBDCs as well, like in projects involving autom automation, like Project Mariana, which instead of in intermediaries uses EMMs, practically programs taking care of settlements in cross-border transactions. So, what are the experiences of the BIS with regards to smart contracts? Uh, what uses uh, do you see for them in the future of finance? 
Well, so, so let me uh, take it up a level. I think programmability is, is one of the promises of this new digitalization. Uh, and, I think, and I think it can have great benefits uh, in how we design the uh, financial system uh, going forward. And one of the nice features of distributed ledger technologies that you mentioned is that there's some level of programmability is inherent in, in the whole setup. And it's true, as you also mentioned, that in the BIS Innovation Hub, we are using uh, smart contracts in, in, in a lot of our, our projects. But I think it's important to think about, uh, when you think about programmability uh, in, in a central bank context, is the what, who can program and, and what can be programmed. And in terms of the who, if you look at the, the decentralized finance world out there, everybody can program. But I think in, in a central bank context where we are thinking mostly about what you call permission set up where, where there's a certain number of participants that are allowed in, I'm not sure that it, it would necessarily be everyone that would be allowed to program. And the other point is like, what should be allowed to program? And there are some people that argue that money should not be allowed to be programmed. And so, so there's a big discussion around whether if money is programmable, is it then money? And I think I am in the camp that think if you can actually program money, it's probably not uh, money. For example, we don't think about food stamps as money because you can only use them in certain stores or for certain products. Um, so I think, I think thinking a high level about what is it that we want to achieve with uh, programmability, I think, is, uh, is very important. Whether it's smart contracts or just pieces of code, I think, you know, that's second order. Thank you. So, Mr. Chang Chun, uh, some other comments right. to, the, to the smart yeah. contracts? Yeah, we, we actually, we have deployed uh, uh, the smart contracts uh, in our system, of course, without impeding is our currency functions, like, um, you know, uh, uh, Martin have said. And of course, uh, the smart contract will be centralized and managed uh, because only the central bank can uh, manage to, you know, the, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, because we, for each uh, commercial bank, they will have their own environment. We have to make it a more is a universal instrument for the, all the society. So that means we are going to have, uh, we, we have already provided a, uh, uh, a standard, um, or, you know, environment for the whole society, for the whole, uh, for, for all the private, private sectors to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, to participate. Of course, we have to review all the templates of their smart contracts to ensure the smart contract contracts could not be used in, uh, you know, any illegal transactions like gambling, like of, uh, you know, money laundering, or or other other illicit transactions. And uh, of course, uh, the features uh, will enable self-executing uh, payment payments according to predefined conditions or terms agreed between the two concerned parties to facilitate uh, the business model innovation, of course, at the same time to minimize or reduce the, um, the uh, contract honoring cost. That's the key of the smart contracts. And of course, in, in, the, in the environment, business environment in China, uh, we have utilized or deployed the smart contracts to ensure the prepayment uh, uh, pre pre prepayment could be secured and to ensure the, the interest of the users. So that, that's the, the current use of uh, uh, smart contracts in the ECNY um, uh, environment. So of course, after the deployment of uh, the uh, uh, smart contracts, there are, still, there are still some residual risks those residual risks should be covered by the traditional legal system. And that, that, that residual risk cannot be solved by the smart contracts or the program, programmability of the CBDC. But from our experience, the uh, uh, smart contracts or prog programmability of the CBDC definitely reduced, uh, have already reduced the cost of the 
contract honoring or the compliance of the uh, the uh, business contracts. Thank you. Back to you. Okay. Thank you. So after the smart contracts, let me let me raise another very regularly mentioned questions. So that's the privacy issue. So how can we or can we provide the proper privacy solutions uh, for, the, for the society within the CBDCs? So what's your view about that? Um, I think if you look at cash, uh, I always say that uh, no matter the question about the future of payments, cash can really not be the answer. But, but there's two redeeming features potentially about cash. One is that it, uh, it, uh, it provides an offline solution and also that it actually in certain cases provides a, a useful level of privacy. Obviously also provides other types of privacy in situations where it's not so useful. Um, and so that's why we are one of the projects we're working on in the BIS Innovation Hub. We're trying to explore different types of privacies that you could implement with the central bank digital currencies. And one of them is that with cash, you know, both sides are basically private or anonymous, if you want to say. So what we're exploring is a situation or ways of money or ways of transactions where it's only one side of the transaction that's private. So in particular, for example, we have a project that's called Chopiong, and in that case, it's the payer is private, but the ones that is receiving the money is not private. So for example, if I go to a pharmacy and have to buy some legal drugs, then my side of the transactions cannot be seen by the government, the banks, and so on and so forth, but that the pharmacist receives money, that can be seen, and that's also helpful for tax purposes. When I take money out like into this uh, system by uh, basically a, like an ATM, that can be seen as well. So we're trying to explore whether this form of asymmetric privacy would be enough to you know, have KYC, AML, those kind of concerns, and also provide enough uh, privacy so that people might want to adopt a new central bank a digital currency. And I think that was discussed by your deputy governor. If it doesn't get adopted, as we have seen, the, it has been in China, but I was just in Africa, and Nigeria has rolled out a CBDC, and there the adoption rate at currently is less than half a percent. So I think this is an area that central banks really need to think through what kind of, uh, as you mentioned, what are the interest rates features on, on a CPDC, but also what are the privacy features of a CPDC. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chang Chung, may I raise the same questions to you? So you are the front, you are the front runners in, 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 in the CBDC, so what are the first experiences uh, in, yes. in the field of privacy? Thank you, Governor. I. Uh, I agree with uh, Morton that uh, definitely privacy is a very important issue, especially uh, for the public goods created by a public agency like uh, the central bank. Uh, but, and also, of course, we are actually facing up to a lot of pressure from the general public, public that to protect the privacy of the, uh, of the people. Uh, you know, uh, privacy, uh, during the uh, business of the big techs and the fintechs, uh, privacy uh, have already been compromised uh, by those big techs and 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 and, and fintechs. Uh, of course, so uh, the privacy definitely will be our first priority in our uh, project. But at the same time, having said that, there is no freedom without constraints. Uh, in the digital era, and full anonymity of CD, CBDC without necessary regulatory rules and risk control measures might be used for criminal activities. So we are also facing up to the pressure from FATF. Uh, definitely in the review of the FATF program, the CBDC definitely will be a very important content of their review. So the anonymity of a CBDC shall take the form of li limited anonymity on the basis of sufficient risk control procedures involved. Uh, as such, full anonymity has never been the right choice for all the CBDCs. That's my personal opinion on, uh, on that. So we, we 
actually use the term of managed anonymity as one of the our features design of uh, the ECNY. Uh, so to meet uh, the at the same time, you know, on one hand to meet the public demand for anonymity and privacy protection. On the other hand, it also keeps the capacity of combating illicit activities and maintaining financial security as a critical prerequisites. So there are three at attributes that help ECNY could achieve uh, managed anonymity. First, uh, ECNY adopts a two-tier model design in line with the uh, in line with the PBC and authorized operators, which is the second tier, collect data only within their duties. The authorized operators uh, collect and store only necessary personal information required for services and operational purposes. And the PBC, the central bank, only process the inter-institutional transactions information transferred via ECNY backstage system for processing and reconciliation purposes. And uh, secondly, uh, our, we provided a uh, wallet matrix of ECNY and following the principle of anonymous for small value and uh, traceable for high value transactions. So we designed a wallet a wall matrix uh, where the wallets could be classified by the KYC level, by the type, and also by the type of holders, by the career type, and by the managed uh, management authority. So for the least uh, privileged uh, wallets, people can open a wallet only with their uh, mobile phone number. So uh, actually the PBC, the central bank, or the uh, service provider, this, the authorized operator, actually the, uh, they don't know the uh, real identity behind that mobile number. So the, the least uh, privileged wallet holder will be remain anonymous to the authorized operators and, and to the central banks. So in that case, the the least privileged uh, category of the wallets will remain anonymous. But if you want to make bigger transactions, you have to uh, review or uh, uh, upde upgrade your wallet to the third category or the second category. That means you have to provide your real ID information to the authorized arbiters and the central banks, uh, the central bank, the PPC. And also, uh, uh, the user consent, uh, we, we deploy a user consent-oriented rule based on the two-tier design, as well as the wallet matrix design, the ECNY app collects information based on user consent and it follows the rules of, of autonomy, transparency, and data minimization. So in summary, the digital version of fiat currency, the ECNY, ought to be the uh, vanguard in pr protecting user pride, privacy and personal information on the basis of uh, keeping the capacity to combat the illicit activities. We have to keep the balance between combating uh, criminals and pr protecting uh, people's privacy. Thank you. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So, gentlemen, let me raise the, the last question, uh, which is linked to the geopolitics. So, um, I think we know well the history, uh, how the, the developments in the financial transactions uh, uh, linked to the developments in the global economy, in the globalization, in the geopolitics. So, so nowadays there are uh, many readings that there are some uh, competition, uh, some growing competition between uh, between the economies, between the big economies, between the big currencies. So, so what do you think? How the the whole CBDC developments will have an impact on the on the on the globalization? 
uh, and how will it, it, it will have an impact on the, on the role of the different currencies in the, in the global financial markets. A quick, quick reaction, please. Mr. Beck. I think the, the, the hope and the, the vision for central bank digital currencies is that they should be able to help solve the issues that we have in cross-border payments. And by helping solving that, both maybe starting on regional levels and then going on a more global level, I hope that that can be an impetus to, to further strengthen or, or re-strengthen globalization. I think, I think cross-border payments is, is a big issue, both for retailers but also for, for commercial access. And I think it's, as the G20 has also made that uh, uh, priority, and I, I hope that we can, we can make progress in that. And CBDCs might be part of the solution. Thank you very much. The same question to you, Mr. Chang Chun. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, Morton actually uh, raised a very important uh, point that uh, the G20 and the CPIMI initiative actually uh, uh, have a very important task that is to solve the trilemma of uh, international uh, payments, uh, especially in the geopolitical uh, environment and that, and also the corresponding relations, relations, banking relations is almost, uh, you know, uh, in a very difficult situation. So uh, CBDC should shoulder the responsibility to uh, strengthen the globalization and strength to improve uh, the, um, the uh, uh, international settlement and payments. And also, we, we actually uh, joined several initiatives uh, called, uh, uh, actually organized by CPMI and BIS, uh, especially the BIS Innovation Hub, uh, under the help and the guidance uh, by uh, Morton and, uh, and his team. We enjoy uh, our, uh, you know, uh, uh, collaboration with the BIS Innovation Hub in the, in the projects like uh, Enbridge, so we are uh, very honored to, uh, uh, to uh, participate uh, in that program. But having said that, uh, personally, uh, when I talk about the question of internationalization or uh, globalization of uh, fair currency, uh, we should uh, understand that it's not, a, not only a technical uh, problem, but also a uh, relevant governance, uh, legal framework in the institutional arrangements. So um, as uh, uh, you may re read uh, an article, uh, uh, you know, by uh, uh, Mr. Hank Paulson, the uh, former uh, secretary of the Treasury, he, he said uh, he actually uh, emphasized that uh, the economic size the prospects of for future growth integration with the global economy is the key factors of a, a, a currency a currencies globalization. So, CBDC is never a panacea for every problems. Uh, it's only uh, one, uh, you know, uh, solution uh, in the in the. Uh, in the global efforts in that, in that case. Thank you. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chang Chun. Uh, our time is getting to the end, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Beck, Mr. Chang Chun again for accepting our invitation to this panel. I think uh, our audience benefited a lot from your comments. Uh, the main uh, comments I had from, from, the, from the conversation is that uh, the CBDC, it's, it's pretty certain that the CBDC will be the part of our life in the, in the near future. Uh, but it's also clear that we need a cautious approach, well-designed uh, project uh, to, to deliver the benefits uh, from, the, from the new technologies. So thank you very much again. Uh, and now we can step to the to the next uh, next panel, if I'm right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good day.
Deputy Governor Virag and distinguished speakers, thank you very much. I'm sure we all found tremendous value in this fireside chat. We are now moving to our first panel discussion to explore the possible introduction of the retail or wholesale CBDCs. I am pleased to invite Mr. Daniel Palotai, Executive Director of the Monet International Monetary Fund, to stage as the moderator of the panel. Can I give you this? Welcome. So, before I invite all our panelists to the stage, Mr. Palotai, please tell us what you find the most interesting in the topic of CBDCs. Are CBDCs really the future of money? the money of the future. Thank you very much for, for inviting uh, me to, the, to moderate this very exciting panel discussion. Uh, of course, this is one of the topics uh, hotly debated among uh, the central, banker, uh, central bankers in the global community. It's no wonder, because either a, a retail or a wholesale version of the CDBC or some parallel instruments uh, are about to be introduced. So obviously that will affect all our lives, our lives as central bankers. It is a very uh, complex and overarching uh, uh, area because the future of money will, is in our hands, where we are going, where we are heading. So it's no wonder that this is also high on the agenda of international organizations like the International Monetary Fund or the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, it is also not surprising because the repercussions of, of where we are heading will have significant uh, uh, implications for, for conduct of monetary policy, financial stability, cyber security, competition, but even uh, geopolitics, if I may say. So it's definitely not just a, an intellectual exercise, but definitely it will directly and indirectly influence the financing of the real economy uh, going forward. So what do we need to do to implement a successful CDBC? Central banks definitely have to make sure that the new instrument will be broadly used, or at least according to the expectations. How can they make this happen? They have to be in close cooperation uh, with the vendors, technology providers, payment partic market participants, but also the future users themselves. So obviously that requires a very complex uh, project management uh, attitude from the central banks. Also, they have to be very coherent in the uh, decision making. And if I may say, central banks need to be like fintechs. They have a value proposition for a true market need and they have to ensure that uh, the, new the new product will be de uh, uh, developed in line with that, and actually they will be disrupting current status quo in the markets. Some of the central banks will be able to live up the expectations, some will be perhaps less successful, and definitely most of them will follow the front runners. How can we meet these challenges, and how, how, what can help us in this journey, I think, uh, I hope that this panel will help us explore these questions. But before we invite uh, the dis distinguished panelists to the, to the floor, let me just give you two more um, uh, messages uh, from the IMF uh, behalf, where we stand with the CDBC thinking. Of course, we at the fund firmly believe that our policies should aim to leverage all the benefits of the digital technologies, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that we are able to mitigate the risks th that come with innovation and change. Given the rapid changes in all these areas uh, and, and the dramatic uh, and fast rise in, in public and, and private digital money, the, the IMF has also adopted a very comprehensive uh, digital money strategy already back in 2021. We really aim at helping the, uh, the efforts of the central banking community in a coordinated manner. Uh, we have identified a number of subtopics in which we engage and uh, which we analyze more closely. Of course, we want to concentrate to those areas which are close to the fund's core mandate, like the implications of digital money for the international monetary system, what should be the modalities to improve cross-border payments, and uh, what are the effective uh, policy responses to crypto assets. And we started analyzing these subtopics uh, themselves, and uh, in parallel, we are also assisting and helping with capacity development members, you members of the central banking community, so that you can, you, do your jobs in the best possible way. 
As a result, the digital money workflow has now become a key pillar also of the institution's uh, structural agenda. So from time to time, you will hear uh, also from the fund communication uh, in this regard, and I trust that uh, uh, the panelists will be able to add to this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Pate, thank you for the introduction. Now, let me call on stage our distinguished speakers and please take your seat. We have Mr. Marius Juriglas, Senior Vice President of SuperHow. We have Ms. Petja Niederlander, Director for Payments, Risk Monitoring and Financial Literacy, the Österreichische Nationalbank. We have Mr. Hamarak Muanjak, Chief Representative in London from the Bank of Thailand. And Mr. Shu Pui Lee, Advisor to the Governor, Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. Mr. Paite, the floor is yours. Very interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, before I, I go to the questions of which I have a list, I would like all of you to tell one key message which you would like the audience to remember definitely after I will go to many different areas. And uh, possibly before you are served uh, lunches, there will be a quiz or maybe some test that you are actually remembering these key messages. So attention please, and maybe we go from, from, the, from my right to the left and ask each of you just to give one key uh, message as a takeaway. So first of all, thank you for having me on this panel. I think it's a really interesting subject, but straight to the point. One key message. Um, the most uh, focused use case that central banks are working on in the uh, digital currency space is uh, retail use of CBDC. Uh, that's not the most obvious use case. The most obvious use case is uh, cross-border usability of CBDC, and according to the latest study, only a few central banks are working on that. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to say th big thank you to the Central Bank of Hungary uh, to invite the Central Bank of UAE to participate in this very impressive event. Okay, one message. Um, I've been doing financial market infrastructure over like 22 years, okay, with two central banks now. And then we, we spend a lot, a lot of time to build LTGS, faster payment, cross-border connectivity. My latest, you know, experience like the Buna project in, in, in the MENA region, uh, connecting 22 countries. It took years, okay, in terms of the technology, the building of those infrastructure. But my latest experience seeing is believing, okay, the Enbridge project, uh, we took only six months, okay, from scratch to the pilot to build the infrastructure using the latest technology. So that's the promising thing I, I, I really see in my last 22 years, okay. That, you know, it, we, we put through real transaction, real money, 22 million US dollars, 162 transaction, four countries to do cross-border trade settlement payments. Okay, even my boss, the governor of the Central Bank UAE, and they sat there uh, to observe some of the pilot transactions. Said, Is it really done? Only a few minutes? You know, to do a cross-border cross payment from China to the UAE, settled, cleared, and the corporate got the money, real, real good money? I said, yes, done. Really? Okay, so that's, the technology is really promising. Okay, that's my key message. Thank you. Um, yes, also from my side, thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure and honor to be in this panel. Um, well, before giving you my message, just to answer why now. So money is uh, uh, undisputedly a public good and very important for the economy. And a lot of people will say, well, we have a lot of uh, electronic payments instrument out there. Why now digital euro? We see that the technology and change in customer behavior are shifting uh, continuously in the recent years. But the last two years, there was a leapfrog and a very, very strong change uh, through the pandemic and the um, payment innovations mostly on the user um, end side towards um, electronic payments. 
And um, although markets which strongly invested in technology and companies which strongly invested in technology have advantage here, others do have a disadvantage. And we do see that the infrastructure did not come so quickly uh, on this uh, change. So we do see payments infrastructure processes being the same old one, so um, in the same old uh, bag. So I believe digital currency and digital euro now are necessary to provide a robust, efficient, and uh, particularly uh, better infrastructure for innovations in Europe, so the um, European economy can thrive on it. Yes, so uh, first, good morning, uh, and thank you to Bank Magna Nemseti for uh, giving this opportunity to participate in this prestigious uh, event. Um, uh, it's on, an honor and privilege to be here. So just, uh, just to mention um, this new type of money, now it can be settled in peer-to-peer -peer manner. It could be programmed in a much more customizable way compared to a direct debit. It could be... Uh, done in DVP, del delivery versus payment, uh, and PVP, pay payment versus payment. So it lowers uh, counterparty risk. So with this kind of features, I think it's the duty for central banks to explore the potential of this kind of money, whether it's wholesale, retail, or cross-border. Of course, there are risks that, uh, that we need to learn and to mitigate. So I think it's a duty that we explore, explore the potential, and that's, that's my message. Thank you very much to all of you. And Hamarak, you just rightly pointed out a very important uh, issue that we really have to distinguish between retail CDBC, which aims at being used by the general public, and wholesale CDBC, which serves uh, uh, payments by, 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 by market participants and central banks. Uh, let me now, in the beginning of this, um, of this discussion, maybe focus with a few questions on, on, on the retail part. And first, I would like to turn to Marius, Marius, who was a f former chair of the of BIS Innovation Network CDBC Working Group. So definitely you could follow the work in this pilot implementation uh, very, very closely. Um, so I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, what you think, in your opinion, when comparing retail and, and the wholesale directions, what are the most promising and perhaps evidence-based uh, cases you could identify? Thank you. I think this is a really uh, good thing that uh, the central banking community came together and established such a forum, which is being led by the BIS, where in somewhat open way, uh, such a very geopolitically sensitive issue of designing central bank digital currency is being shared. So having said that, and uh, subject to the disclaimer of what could be disclosed and what could not be disclosed, what I observed was that every central bank is taking that uh, issue very seriously. So that's the first point. Uh, it's the fear of missing out of not being up to speed if there is a use case. And uh, I witnessed a lot of uh, skepticism two, three years ago on uh, the viability of uh, central bank digital currency as such. Uh, central banking community had a very you know, it's, you know, it's the most uh, prominent economists uh, gathered together trying to understand what is the added benefit of allowing the public to deal in central bank liabilities in digital form. And uh, yes, uh, the world is very diverse and some countries are approaching it, it from the financial inclusion perspective. Uh, financial inclusion of not being able to open a bank account, therefore you have a digital wallet in central bank digital currency. Uh, others uh, from the developed side of the world are approaching it from the capital market efficiency perspective. How do we improve uh, the, the backside, the backbones of the financial plumbing system so that capital moves more efficiently, that the execution of trades is faster, uh, more resilient, uh, cheaper, and that's the wholesale CBDC side. So in the retail CBDC side, I noticed that the front runners have been uh, smaller countries uh, around the world, uh, usually led by the use case of financial inclusion. So I'm very much intrigued to see what the future will bring, but uh, so far I noticed that it's uh, countries in uh, in Africa, in the Caribbean. Uh, of course, there is uh, now this uh, live uh, digital currency of uh, digital yuan in, in China. 
but I'm having difficulty seeing uh, how it is competing with uh, private uh, methods of digital payments. And uh, that's what I think we can uh, talk about more later. Thank you, already brought up quite some uh, interesting uh, questions we should uh, go into, but let me now turn to, to Petia. Uh, your central bank, the Österreich National Bank, is, is really ahead with uh, analysis and research, and you have done a, a, a very nice working paper, including a survey. Uh, in which you emphasize the need for constant communication between the central banks and, and future users. And I'm wondering, uh, what could you identify, wh what is missing in, in, in this regard, in terms of communication? Um, thank you. Yes, we did uh, last year a survey with 2,000 participants uh, at the age of uh, 16, and we figured out that two-thirds of them actually never heard about digital euro. And if they ask second time um, what they think about, would it be a nice idea, 50% more said that... Uh, there may be personal interest, in particular the younger people, they expect to have a, a benefit of that, personal benefit, but uh, uh, actually there is a very diluted understanding of it. Um, on the other hand side, we observed that cash is perceived to be uh, the um, payments mean uh, which should stay there, at least for the security and the choice of the customer to go back to cash if necessary. So we do see the the, the, the need for resilience and the need for backup. And we also um, see that people are strongly satisfied with existing payments uh, options. So to conclude here, what we derive out of this is that uh, we see uh, there is a necessity of thorough debate with the public, with the general public. We uh, see also a need of dialogue with the po uh, policy makers because they are the ones who will decide about uh, digital year introduction at the end of the day. And we do see the need of uh, um, debate with the financial intermediaries, banks, who will be uh, distributing it. So that kind of conversation is still not happening. We do have a lot of research on a technical level. We have an expertise. We are um, discussing in the governance bodies with the European uh, Commission, with the consumer organizations, with the commercial organizations, but the clear and uh, clear coined messages and clear conversation is still to be uh, introduced, and I believe this should happen very quickly. Very good point. And now that you, uh, you've already pointed to the digital euro, I, let me just quickly uh, turn back to Marius and ask you what you think will be the key functionalities uh, of, of the digital euro, and, and when can uh, euro uh, area citizens expect to be using it? Just very briefly. So very briefly, uh, Central, European Central Bank has uh, issued a consultation on the functionalities and uh, uh, out from that communication, uh, the public could understand that one particular function of uh, digital euro will be switched off. Uh, that is the store of value functionality. Uh, meaning that due to the financial stability concerns, the ability of a citizen has not been decided, anything has not been decided, but that's being discussed. Uh, the ability of a wallet holder uh, to hold significant amounts of digital euro will not be allowed uh, because that is due to the concern that that could drain the uh, commercial banking system of liquidity. And then the question is, uh, what is money without store of value function of money? And uh, how does that differ from the programmability? Because programmability is a conditionality of payment or conditionality of something. And that's already conditionality. But European Central Bank said there will be no programmability of uh, digital euro. Oh, thank you. Now that you raised it, I can't stand having one more question on the digital euro again to Petty, and then I promise I, I will, we will move on. So uh, you think that the digital euro will be attractive? And do you expect that there will be a significant pickup in the, in the first year? Will it be an... an, an, an an instant you know, success story, or you will, the ECB and your central banks will have to fight long to, to get it uh, um, uh, used by, by, a, by a broader uh, uh, segments of, of the society? Can it be competitive, basically? Yeah. Well, as a central banks, we are never in the business of fail fast, so just to address this thing of a startup. Um, so, um, being very fast is not uh, primarily goal of the uh, CBDC as such. 
but uh, we see from the experience with the SEPA introduction that it took us about five years to have a broad reach and broad usage of SEPA. And that was without a regulation to ensure the ubiquity. So now we expect from the Commission a regulation which should come in the second quarter of this year, which will be the basis for the digital euro. And here in that regulation, we do expect uh, to have uh, a certain uh, regulation on the reach, so acceptance of the digital euro. We expect it to be accepted on all uh, point of sale where electronic payments are accepted. And that uh, is uh, uh, known, so reach and trust are the two factors which make payment systems successful. I guess trust is undoubtedly in the euro system. Um, so this is on the set, what it will be used, I guess, yes, how quickly well, our uh, aspirations are not to be so quick, but um, yeah, in the next five years after introduction. Very encouraging. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now uh, turn our focus to an equally uh, exciting topic, which is this uh, wholesale CDB. There's uh, ma many promising uh, benefits we can expect from it, like 24-7 uh, operations. Um, so this brings me uh, to address a, a question to Thamarak. What, what, what do you think uh, that, um, uh, would you agree that the wholesale uh, CDBCs will precede the introduction of, of retail ones? Can they be faster? And what do you think, which are the most advanced experiments which we know of today, um, and when can we expect them to become actually operational? Yes, so it's, it's a, not necessarily the case that wholesale will precede retail because this depends on a complex combination of factors on both the retail and wholesale side. So on the retail side, you have uh, access to central bank money, which in smaller economies, um, in small island economies, might be limited. But then on the other hand, you have large economies like China, of course, where access to cash, as we heard from Mr. Chang Chun Mu, uh, is very difficult. You can't pay taxes, you can't pay at restaurants. So this is probably one factor that drives uh, retail CBDC faster. Another uh, factor that might drive faster uh, introduction of retail CBDC is uh, rely reliability of the existing systems. So if it's not reliable at all, then countries are probably trying to leapfrog the whole system. But if it's too reliable, then you are too reliable on private sector. So these are two factors that might drive retail faster than we thought. Then on the wholesale side, uh, there are benefits, um, but RTGS is already very efficient. Uh, we have seen a renewal in terms of standardizing, uh, I mean, the, the ISO 20, uh, 20,000, 22, for example. But then after we have done our POC, it turns out that commercial banks came to us and asked, why don't you just introduce CBDC now? Because they can see the benefits from programmability, from DVP, uh, to offer to their clients and make business, make money out of it. So these are the like, co complex uh, combinations. And we have to, to be future-proof, of course, but to ensure that risk will not come and haunt us back later. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned the benefits, but let me also try to explore with you what are the challenges and possible bottlenecks with the introduction and a broader pickup of, of, of wholesale CDBC. So, uh, Shufiu, I would like to ask you what you see, uh, what can prevent uh, wholesale CDBCs from, from, from broader use? Okay, before that, I personally don't like retail wholesale. I look at that as cross-border domestic. Okay, and, and <laughs> very different view. Okay, I, I want to sit back a little bit, you know, because when we look at CBDC, we always think about payments. Okay, very narrow scope. Okay, but you look at the entire world development. I mean, I remember, you know, uh, maybe a year ago, I also attended the governor meeting of BIS, uh, helping my boss, and I hear, I heard a lot of governors talking about DeFi and all these developments, and then we are disconnected. Okay, the, the conventional financial system with the kind of tokenized world. So I, I think CBDC is the opportunity to go into that. And then I, I believe in five years' time, now talking about tokenization of deposit, tokenization of loans, any financial asset, if we don't have CBDC, we are out of the picture because they don't have a medium exchange to, to do clearing settlement. Okay, so if you ask me the, the issues, uh, stopping all this. I think central bank is very good 
in writing policy papers, okay, but not doing implementation in terms of the. How many bank. central bankers in this room? <laughs> I'm a central, I'm, you know, I'm in the central banking uh, career for 22 years, uh, apart from you know the banking experience. So I consider myself as a central banker, but it's true, okay. And then even within the central bank UAE, we because we is we have very international uh, setting, people from all over the world. And then we spend a lot of time talking about theoretical policies, risk, et cetera. I think now with the new technology, we can do an agile approach. We don't need to go full blown in one go. So we have a big argument. Why don't we do it step by step? I mean, Enbridge is a very, very good example. Okay, we, we started proof of concept a few months. We use external vendor consensus to build the prototype. We found, oh, interesting. Then we start, okay, we should go for pilot with real money. Then we start from scratch to build that six months with the help of China, okay, they, they're amazing. 300 plus software engineers. Done. Okay, what's stopping us to immediately do the pilot? Legal framework, policies, software agreement, all this. It took another like eight, nine months. Okay, we put the minimum viable to protect everybody. Some of them, personally, are a little bit theoretical, okay, but we still need to do that because we have 20, 20 commercial banks coming in. They are putting their, their clients there to, deal, to do real trade settlements, okay? So if you ask me, we are also the, the, the showstopper ourselves, okay? Because we always get into a lot of theoretical risk, but now with the new technology, new approach, we can do it bit by bit. We don't need to have a full policy setting all the legal framework ready, we can still do a bit, a bit, a bit, and then at the same time, this we learn and then we improve. That, that's, that's my view, okay. And then another major thing, I think for cross-border, uh, I mean the last section mentioned about geographic politics, that I, I can see that may be a, an issue. Okay, what our approach is at the moment, um, I set up the strategy for the Central Bank UAE, okay. We do multilateral, we know it's difficult for from some jurisdiction they work together. We also do bilateral, okay? And then so, so happened, I mean, UAE, we, we send a lot of money out. Okay, we are the second largest rem outward remittance country in the world, although we are only 10 million people. So we, we engage bilaterally with some trading partners to do CBDC bridge, and then we look at domestics. So we don't think retail, wholesale, we say cross-border domestic. Okay, that, that's how we look at that. But definitely, use cases, we need to look at retail and, and wholesale. Sorry, I, I saw something here and there. No, no, thank you for, for explaining that. Uh, I saw uh, Marius uh, sometimes nodding this way, sometimes the other way, but in international community, one has to be very cautious because in not every uh, uh, country uh, does nodding this way mean a yes, and others it means a no. So I'm, I'm turning back to, to Marius just to clarify and see what you can agree on, what, what could be maybe uh, more subject to debate. Yes, probably we need all to be very humble because sometimes we have strong views, but uh, we don't uh, realize. But uh, coming back to this uh, wholesale uh, retail or domestic uh, cross-border, uh, payments industry or just transaction business uh, is very small margin business. Uh, the biggest uh, fruit there to grab is the capital markets efficiencies. Uh, uh, what's the reason why we still don't have pre-trade, pre -trade, post-trade transparency in the bond market? What's the reason why only 17% of bonds issued across the world had only one transaction last year? How do we facilitate the broader access to that? How do we make sure that our citizens are not only keeping miserable deposit earning interest rates, uh, deposits in, in the banking industry, but have access to the sovereign bond market. Or, of course, with due diligence to the consumer protection and uh, fitness tests to the capital markets. That is the biggest fruit out there. And coming back to the European Union, uh, European Union implemented last year a DLT pilot regime regulation, which is an open invitation to the financial infrastructure providers, CSDs, broker dealers, uh, multilateral trading facilities, go out there and show to us that implementing a DLT infrastructure, you can cut the silos, 
boot, settlement, clearing, trading uh, on one layer. And if that will come through, that is the good usability of, uh, and I didn't mention the CBDC. Oh, it's out there because you need to settle in central bank money. Thank you. You mentioned DRT, uh, and I'm wondering whether we agree on that DRT can actually give central banks stronger control above uh, the use of the currency. Uh, Shupui, do you have a, a view on this? Okay, I think, the, as I keep mentioning technology, okay, the, 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 the DLT technology does help a lot. I used the same example, Enbridge, okay. Now we move to MVP, okay. We need to completely decentralize. We don't want anything centralized. So each central bank has full control of what they own in terms of data, infrastructure, operation, etc. Okay, so only this technology allow us to do that. I mean, in the conventional technology, we I build so many LTGS, faster payment, you know, cross-border LTGS connectivities. We still need a central body, central governance committee. With the technology, we can decentralize as much as possible. We own our own control. And then the beauty of the programmability of the tokens also help us even our CBDC go outside our jurisdiction. So we can build control in that. I mean, like some countries, they have capital flow control. I mean, if those CBDC are not coming back, it, with certain time, it can be expired. Okay, they set some condition. That, that gives us the comfort, okay, for, for money laundering, for the usage, et cetera. So, I think um, the only thing we, we still struggle, I, I, I had a, a lot of conversation with Mr. Mu uh, uh, from people, People's Bank of China. How can we really automate those rule setting in the technology, okay? I mean, they, they, they are very clever. I mean, they, they even the consensus mechanism, they said, Shipu, you don't need to use our, our Enbridge source code. You can, for example, you can take quarter, and then they have the consensus mechanism to, to allow us to plug in. Okay, then we, we think we have more choice. Okay, eventually, I mean, on, honestly, I, I'm Chinese, but even my boss say, can we rely on the Chinese technology forever? So I say, okay, we have a choice. Okay, and then when, when we mature, we can, we can put in our technology and then to allow that to plug in to the Enbridge continue operation transact with other jurisdictions. So that, that kind of decentralization really help a lot. But there's still, okay, I have to admit that, are still areas I, I personally struggle, okay? And then how can we automate those rules for payment system operating rules is so important. How can we fully automate? And, and I mean, a little bit like, like Bitcoin, you know, they, they don't need anybody to operate that. It's, the rules are fully automated, but, but I don't like that. I mean, that, that, that's a lot of freedom, but anyway, I think that really opened up the door for a lot of innovation, to be really honest. Thank you. You mentioned programmability of, uh, of CDBC. Uh, I'm not sure whether this, this concept of prog being able to program money is clear to everyone in the audience. So maybe I would ask Thamarak to clarify what does this feature mean that we are programming money? Is this a benefit for the issuer? Is it a benefit for the users? How do you see that? Yes, uh, so programmability, uh, we can think of it at three levels. Uh, at the issuer level of money, for example, in commercial bank money, the banks, we have like direct debit, the banks have to each, I mean, to program their core banking system to do a direct debit. So that's one level at the issuer of money. And then we have at the uh, wallet level, uh, this is where uh, many retail CBDC is using uh, this kind of technology. Money is tokenized, but then you, talk, uh, you program it at the wallet level. And then at, with the DLT uh, uh, system, then uh, you can program it at the actual unit, money unit level. That's why you can program it in a much more customizable way. Uh, you can program it to be bundled against delivery of other assets or currencies. So that's why we have DBP, for example. So there are three levels uh, that we, we need to think about in terms of programmable money. But then what are the benefits? Um, of course, first, uh, DVP and PVP are very important for financial market transactions. Uh, they lower counterparty risk. They allow peer-to-peer -peer, uh, trading uh, with uh, atomic transactions. So that's probably one uh, benefit. Another is automated uh, complex transactions. So when you asked me, uh, my, when you asked my earlier question, I forgot to answer. 
uh, about uh, the most advanced experiments. Uh, let's say, uh, if you are familiar with supply chain financing, you have three parties. You have SMEs issuing invoice to the corporate clients. And then the corporate clients would wait probably 90 days, 60 days before they pay the SMEs. Then you would have this gap of time where SMEs would be squeezed of liquidity. And then if you can have lenders who provide liquid, uh, liquidity to the SMEs at the time using probably smart contracts or, or and using CBDC with smart contracts. So when the time comes that the corporate clients pay back it pays back to the lenders rather than to the, to the SMEs. So this kind of thing could be done in an existing system like escrow account. But it's very, uh, it's very complex. I mean, you have to customize uh, the transactions. So it's not worthwhile for small SMEs with smaller invoice to, to get financing. Uh, with smart contracts, it's cheaper and it's more inclusive. So that's the automation of complex transaction. The third one is innovation. This uh, supply chain financing, invoice financing is only one simple use case. I mean, complex but simple. There could be ma many more uh, use cases that have yet to come out in terms of using programmability. Thank you very much for, for this detailed explanation. Regarding uh, programmability, do we know anything about uh, the, uh, uh, this area in, for the digital euro? I'm not sure whether Petty uh, uh, from uh, Eurosystem Central Bank would want to comment on it, but uh, of course the question is also uh, uh, addressed to, to, to uh, Marius in case you have uh, any insight uh, you would want to share with the audience. Uh, well, we have discussed it quite intensively. I think the, the, um, uh, also Martin said uh, uh, a little bit the aspect of programmable money and programmable payment. So from the Eurosystem point of view, we are against programmable money. Why? Because uh, you should be sure that one euro is one euro and you can spend it anywhere. In case uh, there are some forms, uh, let's assume like loyalty programs or others, which are restricted to certain um, amount of merchants, that would be a um, barrier for entry and that would be an uh, unneeded and unwished um, element uh, in the usage of the digital euro. So no, your system is not going to offer program of money. Yes, we are discussing a lot about program of payments and just to make the difference here, I think it's a little bit more closer to what you said just right now, that's about conditional payments is maybe the better wording for it. So. Yes, we want uh, a straight through end-to-end -end digitalization of processes in the economy because only that makes sense and only that will deliver growth and uh, resilience as such. And in order to do that, we need to offer interfaces to the intermediaries. We need to offer them a possibility to integrate deeply in the value chain of their customers. And this is the programmable payments as such. So part of the Euro, digital euro scheme will be um, also so-called value-added services, and they will uh, allow intermediaries to program interfaces. Thank you, and I saw Marius nodding this way, so that means a yes. <laughs> yes, so the word uh, programmability has been banned at the, at the ECB, but uh, we, maybe we can expand this, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if the adjective programmability is the same or different from conditionality. You know, what is programmability in a code? If, then. What is conditionality? If, then. So maybe it is conditionality. And then you can condition on many things. Uh, you want alcohol and you are below 18? No. Uh, you have received too many digital euros? No. Uh, is that conditionality or programmability? Semantics, uh, but uh, people, and that's my personal view, Then now I'm speaking my view, uh, people want certainty, and with money I want certainty, uh, I don't want conditionality. On that I agree with European Central Bank, uh, that probably, you know, at least one thing should be completely certain. But then, you know, little by little things creep in, uh, like we heard about the Chinese uh, digital yuan, it's private, if less than if greater than, less private. Very big, absolutely not private. That's also conditionality. Thank you, Fend. Thank you for this uh, real life uh, examples. I was almost, almost uh, about to conclude that with all these benefits uh, 
the audience would become a true believer of uh, CDBCs and immediately want to have their uh, own electronic uh, wallets. But of course, when it comes to implementation, then we see that the devil is in the, in the details. So maybe um, let's spend the remaining three minutes a, a bit on, on implementation challenges and bottlenecks and, and, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, I, I could ask you, starting with Amarak, on, on some insight on, 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 on where you see what are, what are the key uh, ingredients for a successful rollout, uh, where you see the, the main bottlenecks and how you, we could address them. But I also um, uh, so, uh, see Petia uh, reacting to this question. So if you have anything to add after, after Samarak, uh, that would be more than welcome. Yes, uh, three things that would help uh, in successful rollout. One is governance. Who runs, the, uh, who runs the platform, who maintains the platform? This is a decentralized platform in many cases. Um, who, pays, who pays for all these things? Who are the respon uh, responsible parties when things go wrong? So the governance is very important. And then infrastructures, soft and hard. You need to look at the legal side. Uh, what is CBDC? You need to look at accounting rules. Uh, how do you account for CBDCs? Uh, you need to look at AML, CFT. So soft infrastructure, uh, it's really important as well. On the hard infrastructure, uh, is DLT the, the most efficient one or not? It's still a question in terms of retail, right? But for wholesale, probably yes. Cross-border, probably yes. Uh, what kind of technology uh, we are going to use? But then probably the third one is probably the most important, is the stakeholder preparedness. So the central bank might need to adjust, I mean, set up a whole new department, have a call center in case things go wrong with retail CBDC. Uh, for the banks, they need to adjust their uh, banking business, they adjust uh, their internal, internal process. So a lot of things need to come before we can have a successful rollout. Thank you. Petia, anything you wanted to add to this? Yeah, I, I fully subscribe what you have said. Um, just two aspects. Um, for successful implementation, you need reach and trust. And I guess for the digital euro, it's extremely important that we get uh, the reach through the legislation and through the political decision. Trust the help in the euro system, uh, it's undoubtful. And the second point is uh, implementation. We need to take on board all stakeholders. For that reason, the euro system decided for a scheme approach for digital euro, where we have the uh, supply side and demand side, meaning uh, banks and intermediaries on the one side and consumers on the other, part of the consultation group of this uh, scheme uh, group. So I do truly believe that just a common uh, collaboration in order to develop the rules and the nitty gritty details of the implementation uh, can be successful. Thank you so much. Final questions, um, uh, let me turn to um, uh, to the other, to the to the question whether central banks can actually learn something from from fintechs, uh, Shupu, you mentioned that you have decades long experience in central banking. Do you still share this view that that we as central bankers can learn from fintechs? Oh yes, certainly. Uh, I mentioned about tokenization. Okay, as I said, I believe in five years time there will be a tokenized kind of financial world, and then the traditional account-based financial world, okay? Going further, I, I don't know, okay? But I believe the tokenized world will, will come very fast, okay? These are driven by the fintech, the, the, those innovations, okay? So if we don't provide, as I said, the medium exchange for them, they will use stablecoin or whatever, crypto for the, for the clearing settlement and the, as a medium exchange. So if we continue separating, uh, central bank from that kind of development, even the conventional uh, um, institu financial institutions, they're looking at tokenization. As I mentioned, tokenization of deposit, loans, securities, whatever financial access they, the asset they may have. So we, we, we cannot wait and see. Okay, we got to get ourselves prepared from a regulatory perspective, also from an infrastructure perspective. So I think we, we need to integrate. I don't think we have a choice otherwise. We, I mean, like when, when Bitcoin came to life, a lot of central banks struggled. How, how can we deal with that? Some of them banned them. Some of them, you know, just turn a blind eye. We don't see that. So I think we've got to get ourselves prepared. This fintech kind of evolution is coming. And I spoke with a lot of global banks, okay? I'm actually from one of the, the, the largest U.S. banks before joining the central bank. I, I keep the dialogue with them, and, and these are coming. Okay, to, tokenization of the entire banking financial system. 
Okay, that, that we, we can ignore that, but in five years' time, we, we, we will struggle. Thanks. Uh, uh, maybe I would also ask uh, whether Marius agrees with this, but I would also like to ask you a final question. That would be the very last after which we have to finish. There is a promise of, of CDBC that it will make uh, money more inclusive. I am wondering whether CDBC will be able to deliver, deliver on this promise, or will people be left out, left behind? Uh, I could think of the elderly, uh, uh, the, the disabled people, those uh, without e-literacy. Um, I'm wondering what you think and how we could uh, address that. that. That would be the final uh, uh, question, and, and you will have the final word in this panel. Thank you for this. Uh, so if I could delay that uh, just a little bit uh, on the what can be learned from fintechs, uh, three things. Cost, uh, fail fast, and added value. Uh, any system that is being built has to be recouped by costs. So if added layers of functionalities, safeties, uh, making it inclusive and everything uh, runs up the system costs very high, then the business case, so-called, uh, could fall through. Fail fast. Uh, out of all the central bank initiatives that I have seen, and I've seen quite a few, None of them have been failed. So maybe central banks should learn, at least fail once, and uh, try to, you know, in a, in a lab experiment, at least. Um, and on added value, uh, what is the added value? In my belief, the, the biggest added value that is being pushed through to the users is that it's like physical cash, but digital. And the biggest benefit of a physical cash is privacy has been shown in all the surveys everywhere. And uh, let's not lose the sight of that added benefit. And there is very strong academic argumentation that use of digital cash is a game theoretical uh, strategy to prevent private market to price products at a higher price, because then I'll switch to using digital cash. Do you want my data? Do you want to train your algorithms? chat GPTs and everything, uh, then provide me a good price. Otherwise, I'll switch to a private mean of payment. And on inclusion, everything has a price. If we want to make sure that everything is included, every, every citizen of a society, uh, everyone is included on a particular service, it has a cost. And then we have to balance if that cost is adequate to our society. Thank you for a very concise answer. I think we have come to the end uh, of our uh, panel discussion. I thank you very much for a very valuable input and insight you have shared with the audience. And I hope that this is also food for thought. And after you, this kind of food for thought, I think there is some other uh, uh, served outside uh, uh, as food. Um, so I would like to thank you for uh, being here and, 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 and wish you a successful rest of the uh, day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palotai. That was indeed a dynamic discussion, and we had several inspiring ideas from our speakers. As our first panel discussion has ended, I am pleased to announce that we will have a lunch break. And for our online audience, we will have a two-hour break. Afterwards, we move to the second session, focusing on the central bank's role in promoting the green economy.